Uh, thank you, Heather. Thank you so much for meeting with us today. Um, and we'll talk about the project that we're specifically working on that we wanted to talk to you about. But uh, first, if you could say your name. And what I'm really excited about is your position is both you know someone with experience and now working in facilities. So if you could just explain that unique position that you hold. Sure. Why you are an expert. Sure. Um, so I work at Vermont Works for Women. I am coming up on my 10-year anniversary. And I've held many different positions in my 10 years, but my current position is as a program manager for Justice Involved Services. Um, I started working in the facility in 2017, and I approach this work from the lived experience aspect. So I myself am a, am a woman in long-term recovery. Um, and um, because when I was in <coughs> active addiction, I did come in contact with the legal system. And so, um, although I wasn't incarcerated at this facility, I do have some experience and have overcome those barriers that, uh, you know, a criminal record will impose. And so, I approach the work um, by recalling what it was like to be in the client seat and what are those services and resources that I could have used when I was in their position. Yeah, nice. That makes you so uniquely positioned, right, for your work? It really does, um, because when I say I get it, yeah. they know I get it. Yeah. Um, and I think also, when I share my story with women, and I'm very open about my story, uh, we do weekly orientations for folks who are new in the facility, and um, that's why I introduce myself to them. So they know right from the beginning, I have been in their seat. And it's not easy, and um, you know, I have a recovery day, and I have a sober day, because I don't think a relapse means your recovery starts over, it just means your sobriety starts over. Because there's lots of lessons that you've learned along the way and a lot of knowledge gains that don't go away. Once you have those knowledge gains, they're yours to keep. Nice, nice. So the project that we're working, there's a few projects we're working on, um, but the one that we really wanted to dig into today is just really trying to make it real, budgets being value statements. So. Uh, right now, as you know, as we know, uh, they're pr proposing about $90 million to spend on a new women's facility. Mm -hmm. And that is one use of funds. Um, and we can still do that and also create a wider network of caring community. And so you're part of that uh, community of care. You're providing services. So first, maybe just let's explore the services that you provide. For, is it reentry or is it prevention? And so we provide in-facility uh, services, preparing women for release and gaining those skills so that they can be successful once released. And then we also provide reentry and transition services. Um, I <clears throat> would prefer to you know, be more on the side of reintegration rather than reentry, because I think um, reintegration is stronger than reentry, and reintegration replies that there's that community aspect, because um, you know, oftentimes when there is substance use disorder, to maintain your recovery, you have to avoid people, places, and things. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to build new people, places, and things. So um, oftentimes, I will work with clients preparing for reentry, and I will encourage them um, to utilize the program COSA, Circle of Support and Accountability, which are through the Justice and Reentry Centers, because that program is structured in a way that three or four community volunteers are on your team and they already have networks in that community that you can now tap into just because they're on your COSA team. And so that really gives you that, that leg up of building new people, places and things. Nice. 
So thinking of all the programs that you offer and the, you know, let's take a, it's so exciting to think vision wise, like, you know, strategy statements. So like if you had more money, like I know COSA from firsthand experience that there's not enough money to provide enough COSAs for the people that want it. So we exactly. know there's, you know, so can you think of the different services that you already provide that could be extended if you had X amount more of money? Well, I think COSA definitely expanding that program so that nobody was left out that wanted to have a COSA team. Mentoring is another way. Um, <clears throat> Mercy Connections uh, runs the mentoring program for uh, women who are incarcerated. And um, I know sometimes people have to wait for a mentor um, before they, and I think also it's important that um, participants aren't just matched with the next person on the list. Like it has to be a really thoughtful and intentional match. We do the same thing when preparing women for employment. It's not about any job, it's about the right job. Because if that woman does not feel valued in the workplace, you're not gonna build that loyalty and that retention that the employer's looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So COSA, uh, mentoring, like both of those, I'm certain could use X amount more money. Do you have, do you have a, an amount that you would? I am not the finance person, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I wouldn't even know where to yes. begin yep. on coming up with a budget. I just know it needs more than it's getting. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and also, I think, um, you know, looking at... Um, the ways the volunteers are trained because not most of the volunteers aren't going to come with that lens of lived experience. Right. Mm -hmm. So if there was integrated into the training of the volunteers, maybe panels with folks who have that lived experience. Um, I'll give I'll give you a good example because I was working with a participant and. She was really struggling to connect with her COSA team, and so we were role-playing different aspects. And she was telling me how, you know, she was communicating to her COSA team that she was struggling to find those activities in her community where she wasn't going to run into the same old people. And one of the COSA team members said, recommended, why don't you participate in Green Up Day? It was just before Green Up Day. And for someone who's never experienced Green Up Day to go by themselves and sign up and volunteer, I think it would have landed better if the COSA team member had said, why don't we go do Green Up Day together? Mm -hmm. um, so that yeah. there is that integration because, you know, um, just recommending Green Up Day, a woman who was formerly incarcerated, the way she processed that was, I have just given the state seven years of my life. I'm not going to go pick up garbage for the state and give them one more day. Mm -hmm. But th that's not the point of Green Up Day. It's community building, and it's that reintegration piece. Yeah. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, there's no training for the COSAs in, from someone either working in facility or that's recently reintegrated from being in facility. So that would be a wonderful thing. Yeah. How do you gain like resources for programs like these? So there's a number of ways to gain resources. Um, Vermont Works for Women is supported by private donor dollars. <clears throat> um, we also have um, uh, philanthropic grants through foundations. And then there's also the state contracts. Mm -hmm. So we have a contract with Department of Corrections for our in-facility work and then our um, re-entry services as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a contract, obviously, as with contracts, things are spelled out. So in our current contract, like we oversee the facility worker program. And it's a way for um, the incarcerated individual to gain work experience also give back to the facility by doing some of the work that supports maintenance of the facility. And then most importantly, they're gaining those work skills and they are gaining that professional 
reference mm -hmm. that's current so it doesn't look like there's this big huge gap mm -hmm. from the time they were incarcerated on their resume because mm -hmm. Vermont works for women because we do you know regular evaluations and performance reviews we address you know performance issues through our accountability action plan um, structure so that if there are issues that are going to jeopardize employment in the community, we can start addressing some of those issues. So are they consistently late or do they not communicate when they've got, um, you know, conflicting appointments for their work? Those sorts of things. So you know these women, you know these women well. Yes. Right? Um, and the recidivism rate, I, I mean, it's a moving target, but it's like 48%-ish you know, in the last 10, 15 years for women in Vermont. Um, so thinking about the women you know and the ones that may be coming back into facility, what do they need? Well, um, I can say it's not a one size fits all. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is. <laughs> Nothing is, and different women need different yeah. supports. I think, you know, the prevalence of trauma yeah. is a big issue and not, um, not getting the trauma addressed and resolved really leads to, you know, repeating the same patterns when they get released. Mm -hmm. I think um, there's a lot of all or nothing thinking thought patterns that happen in the women. So like the first obstacle they, you know, come up against, they throw their hands up and that's it. Throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's easier, just go back. And I can remember when I was transitioning off of reach up that I felt that way often. It seemed like for every gain I made personally, the system knocked me back three. So I can remember a time where um, the employer I was working at offered me a raise. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take it right away because I wanted to see what it was going to do to my benefits. Mm -hmm. And long story short, couldn't happen. I accepted the raise anyway because I de earned it and deserved it. And that raise put $60 or $40 more a month in my net income cost me $100 in benefits. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. with my own experience, I grew up middle class, ended up in poverty due to my addiction. So I knew what I was working back towards. Mm -hmm. And if I struggled and wanted to throw my hands up and say, forget it, it's easier to go back on the system, quit my job, how could those people with generational experiences mm -hmm. understand that it was greener on the other side? Mm -hmm. And that's what drives me today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are ways that the state can kind of cut back on those, on those barriers? Good question. Um, it's challenging because a lot of the money comes from federal government, which have their own mandates. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, um, you know, I'm just thinking of, you know, Medicaid policy. Yeah. Like, if you're incarcerated, Medicaid can't cover any of your hmm. health care or therapy needs. And so even if you have an existing therapist you were, you know, built a relationship with on the outside when Medicaid could cover, you couldn't continue that during incarceration because your counselor can't bill Medicaid for you. Well, you couldn't have it be paid through Medicaid. True. Right? There are other ways that we could step in and provide funding to continue that, right? Like mm -hmm. Potentially, I know there's a lot of overlapping issues with contractors and contracts and who holds the contract. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. I, think, I think the state um, tries to make sure that when they do offer contracts that there's not duplication in services mm -hmm. um, so that the different contractors have very specific lanes. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, which can be a good thing, you know, because yeah. you don't want to pay four different yeah. people to do the same job. Yeah. And it can also have some disadvantages because if there's only that one provider and there's not that relationship building with the client, it's not very client-centered. Right. So how do you balance that? It's it's tough. I wouldn't want to make the decision. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, let's let's remove it. And yeah, I should you know say, right, all that convoluted bureaucratic decision making for sure. Um, but if we know that women, anyone coming out of facility, going into facility where need that therapeutic help, right? Um, what could we, like just thinking vision wise, like what could we do? I think vision wise, um, you know, I'm really hopeful that um, upgrades in technology access will really open a lot of channels. Um, I know, for example, um, with, through Technology Now and contractors, we're able to do remote meetings with local providers. So now they've got a face to the name. They've started building that. So when you get a higher ability appointment the Tuesday after your release at two o'clock, you've already been on screen with who you're meeting with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, I think that goes a long way and I would love to see that expand. Yeah. Yeah. I think opportunities for trainings, bringing trainings in using technology, I think there's a lot of areas there. Um, I would also love to see more like potentially augmented reality. Hmm. So there are certain things that for security reasons, you know, that would be dangerous to train someone in. Um, and through augmented reality, I think there's a way to do some training without having the danger of say the power tools, yeah. but using a plastic model wearing, you know, the equipment, it looks like you're using a circular saw or a chop saw or a welder. Mm -hmm. Oh, smart. And I know that um, there are some states that are piloting and mm -hmm. there are some companies who have developed the technology. Um, I know locally, um, right up at Champlain College, they um, do a lot with augmented reality and we, Vermont Works for Women has met with them to see how can we incorporate this into, you know, like Rosie's Girls or, you know, some other event that we're holding because it's a lot easier to bring a computer and some goggles than it is to bring a whole tool shed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Which, yeah. Um, how do you think it is beneficial to the community, to the broader community, for these reintegration programs? Well, I think it's really important because the majority of folks incarcerated are going to be released. Mm. And who do we want coming into our community? Mm -hmm. Do we want someone who has been through the traditional setting of, you know, power control punishment or do we want someone returning who has been healed mm -hmm. and valued and know that they've got a contribution to make to the community they're joining yeah. yes uh, you talked about power tools let's talk about the old uh, trailblazer, that's, trailblazer. One of, that's one of your programs right I'm yes sure. so that's another you know Therapeutic un unwrapping is part of what is needed for all of us. Um, and also literally homes yes. are needed, right? So uh, I know that people are still in facility because there isn't secure housing. That's so true. That's a, that's, that's a major that, barrier that to is, release is approved housing for sure. 
And then when they shameful. get the approved housing, you know, are there supports and resources in place for them to maintain that housing so they don't lose it, which is a violation often, which sends them back, which contributes to the recidivism. Yeah. yeah. So at one point, Trail, was it Trailblazers that was doing the building of homes? Was it was that the program that was? So doing? it was an earlier rendition um, <clears throat> of what is now our Trailblazer program, um, and the women were at another facility that had the space. But Vermont Works for Women led a modular home where the incarcerated women were able to actually build modular homes that were then, you know able to be sold and to buy materials for the next home. So it was it was a great program when there's space and instructors and you know places for the houses to go. Where and and so that was back in the old days. Back in the old days, yep. pre my time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's no longer because well, the women moved facilities, and especially being at um, where they are now at Chittenden Regional, the space is really limiting. Mm. Um, it just was not built for long-term capacity. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So that would be that's a funding. That's a that's yeah. a choice. Yeah. I mean, in what we from fund. from what I've learned is when. Vermont shifted away from the county jail system mm -hmm. and DOC um, was taking the detainers. Mm -hmm. They built these smaller regional facilities to house the pre pre-trial detainees. Mm -hmm. So until their their day in court happened. And then there were larger facilities after sentencing. Mm -hmm. But you know, that was I think you know, CRCF was built back in the mid 70s. So things change, mm -hmm. you have new leaders, mm -hmm. they make different decisions. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's go on that train for a little bit, like the practical needs that we all need, mm -hmm. right? So housing. Yes. Um, so can you think of other things that we might be more aware of and trying to fund, whether it's programs that help them build houses or just literal housing for reintegration? I mean, housing is, and it, it's not just formerly incarcerated oh, folks, everyone. it's everybody yeah. across the board. So absolutely, housing, um, affordable housing, um, supported, subsidized, you know, I love the model of resident-owned communities, um, if they're affordable. Mm -hmm. um, and so like when I think about some of them, some lot rents are like prohibitive, plus if you've got a mortgage on top of it. And so, um, but with the resident owned model, you know, there's investment. Every person living there has skin in the game mm -hmm. on how they want their community to be. Um, transportation is yeah. a big issue in this, state, you know, unless you live right mm -hmm. here in the Burlington, greater Burlington area, it's challenging. Um, and when I think about, you know, all the appointments the women are required to attend and the buses only run at certain times, mm -hmm. I think it's very um, middle class yeah. to schedule an appointment with someone at one o'clock and you know, get upset if they're 15 minutes late, when their choice was to be 15 minutes late or 45 minutes early. Right, mm -hmm. right, 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 right. Yeah, transportation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Wait, there. I was thinking something when you went to the housing. Oh, like things like therapy. Do you think we need resources to support things like that? Absolutely, um, because um, you know. Th the majority of incarcerated folks have experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, being incarcerated doesn't doesn't give the environment to have true healing. Mm -hmm. um, you can build awareness, you can share knowledge, but that that visceral somatic healing is really challenging in that environment when they're slamming doors, radios going off and those sorts of things. Um, 
I'm a somatic life coach. And so I really um, try to get folks in tune with their bodies because their bodies really will then influence their thoughts and then their behaviors and ultimately their action. And so um, I use an example because when I first learned about somatic practices, I personally made more progress in 12 weeks than I had in 12 years of CBT. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, because CBT, rightly so, begins with the thoughts and the behaviors. Mm -hmm. But if I'm standing in front of a mirror saying affirmations and I've still got the knot in my stomach and the lump in my throat, can I really believe the affirmations I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I work with people to, you know, become aware of their energy. So now today when I say affirmations, I'm able to do it with an open heart and a feeling of joy in my body. Mm. With more resources, what do you think, what a, and we only have five minutes left, or it's like three minutes yeah. left. What do you think Vermont Works for Women could expand to do? Well, I think, um, you know, being able to expand statewide mm -hmm. is really critical. And we, that's one of our, that's part of our strategic plan is to be able to have um, staff that aren't just centralized here in Chittenden County yeah. and have, you know, staff stationed around the state mm -hmm. so that even though the women are incarcerated in one area, they're not released to one area. So how can we have that continuity of services so that if I've been working with someone while they're incarcerated, it doesn't just stop when they get released or I have to switch to only serving them by phone or virtually. Like I'm, if I could have staff to pass off to and help support that warm handoff, I think it would go a lot further. Yeah. And just really quickly, just touching on, um, because addiction is intersecting a lot, so what's the state of, you know, supportive care in that way, recovery housing oh, in Vermont? It's really scary right now. Yeah. I mean, Vermont has no long-term yeah. treatment. Yeah. The only facilities in Vermont give you two weeks, maybe four at the max. Yeah. And my own journey was 12 times at rehab. Yeah. And it wasn't that rehab was any different on the 12th time. It's that I was finally different. And so if there's only a handful of facilities, you know, I always wonder, what if the rule was you only get 10 trips to rehab? Where would I be? Mm -hmm. And I think it also helps me when folks do come back, it's a clean slate with me. Because someone afforded that clean slate to me 12 times. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes back three, four, however many, they're gonna get that exact same service from me as if it was their first time. Yeah. And there's no, there's not even housing. There's, there's two four week programs, but yep. then there isn't even housing once you are gone from two to four weeks, there's, right? There's limited. There's a few, I there's think. There's limited. In I know V4 has a, a handful of houses, Vermont Foundation of Recovery. Mm. There's Dismas. Dismas, yeah. Um, Jenna's Promise. Jenna's Promise is awesome too. Yeah. Jenna's yeah. Promise is yeah. a great Amazing. model. Yeah. As yeah. a matter of fact, um, they integrated a 13 week intensive trauma program. So now everyone at Jenna's Promise, before they even do the employment search and stuff, they do 13 weeks of trauma oh intensive God. outpatient. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an organization out of Colchester. I don't know much about it, but um, I'm just like, oh. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's exciting. Those it kinds is. of programs are really exciting. They are. Yeah, They're really the exciting. And filling it. Yeah. 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 But there's also been a number who have closed, too. Northern yeah. Lights no House yeah. closed. Liberty House closed. Tapestry closed. Mm. Yeah. So I think, yeah. you know, sustainable funding 
is challenging. Mm -hmm. I think the way the philanthropic model is set up, where we, a number of agencies will serve the same population and they go after the same funding. Mm -hmm. So I think the way it's structured, in order for us to qualify for funding, it's almost like we have to cannibalize yeah. participants from other agencies to keep that funding. Yep. But then that other agency, which has a place, like we all have a place, mm -hmm. but the way the, the structure is set up to apply and then that funding's awarded, mm -hmm. I think needs an overhaul. Yes, mm -hmm. and then peer support within facility. I know they're, you know, uh, piloting a program, I think, maybe in Rutland, maybe for peer support oh, within the facility. Oh, for recovery yeah, coaching. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So, is that some, that something also that we could be expanding? Right? Absolutely. Is that happening in CRCF? I, um, so, CRCF has the Open Ears oh, program, right. yeah. um, which actually a, a new cohort is being trained mm -hmm. as we speak. Um, so they go through a training and learn coaching models and methods like motivational interviewing techniques. Um, and it's total confidential. So what they say to the open ears coach doesn't get back to DOC mm. or security. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's a great model. Um, and I would love to see that expand as well. Yeah. Right, because there's not. We both know there's not enough open ear mentors. There's in not the enough facility. open ears yeah. mentors, and um, you know you have to make sure it's the right person doing right. the work too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I think yeah. that's extremely challenging to balance. You know, getting the right people to do the work who aren't going to use their position and leverage and potentially. Because they have their own stuff that they haven't been given the space to work through. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which goes back to um, the therapy that you were talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. In, in my coaching training that I've been taking, um, I had an instructor say, oftentimes as life coaches, we're either one step ahead or one step behind clients we're working with. And I think that's true for any peer model. Yeah. Alrighty, well. Oh, I know, I know we're distracted, but we will continue this time, another but time. Yeah. It was, yeah, Thanks it was so great much, to Heather. Speak with you. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm just starting the conversation of what more could we be doing? Yeah, yeah. I if think we had funding. I think absolutely having you know, expanding awareness and sharing for those who don't have direct interaction with the legal system, or maybe have never had a family member with addiction issues, or um, you know criminal history i think you know just talking and having these conversations and putting it out there universal yeah. energy will take care of the rest nice but yeah nice. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you absolutely thank you yeah